Good afternoon, everyone. Remember we heard about unprecedented Arctic heating in February. Vox puts it out, unprecedented. The world's media grabbed onto it. 2018, look how warm it was. Man-made, unprecedented. Uh, it happened in 1972 and 1976. Let's look at the sunspot cycle and see when it was low. Oh yeah, 1970s. Continuing on cyclical activity, zonal winds in the Arctic behaving strangely. Arctic sea ice volume increasing, 2004 to 2013, should be all-time lows, right? Ice is backing up into ice arches between Greenland and Canada. Hudson Bay, completely covered, should be melting by now. Northern Hemisphere global temperatures, not even a quarter of a degree over baseline. Hey, what happened to that two-degree warming? Antarctic sea ice increasing. Fall, Northern Hemisphere snow extent increasing. 2018 to compared to 2017 and actually how much is that an extra 700 billion tons of snow this is the true state of our climate and while you're watching please remember to subscribe to adapt 2030 and click that bell so you can get the latest updates and visit our sponsor hemp lucid who makes this production possible going to take you over here to WhatsApp with that. Remember, I've linked everything below in the description box so you can chase down all these stories yourself. News media headlines blaring February 2018. Unprecedented heat in the Arctic, but they forget the unprecedented European super freeze occurring at the same time. World news headlines ran with an unprecedented pattern of high temperatures in the Arctic. And they're pointing to this chart here, which is a compilation of temperatures from 80 degrees north latitude encompassing the entire North Pole. Danish Meteorological Institute maintains this site. Temperatures here in Kelvin in the 2018 heat spike. They said it was once in a lifetime thing, unprecedented. It never happened before until we go back to 1972. And also 1976. So you can see that these things are cyclical. And as quickly as the heat spike came, it dissipated and we went right back to normal temperatures. Here's the April 4th measurements. The green is the baseline and you'll see that blue line at right around 273 Kelvin. That's the freezing mark at zero degrees Celsius. So anything below the blue line means it's frozen solid. Up to April 15th, we're right back at normal temperatures again. Don't see the media picking up on this or the 16th. They should be applauding this that our temperatures are returning to normal. This should be the front page news. And let's talk about the unprecedented Arctic heating. It happened in 1972 and it also happened in 1976. Now this is back when the carbon dioxide or the CO2 concentrations were just around 315 parts per million. Today we're at a little over 400. So how did they get the heat back then? Well, let's look at the international sunspot number. This is the monthly mean. Now, if you notice, where is the low point in the chart beyond where we are right now? Oh yeah, 1970s. But somehow the media doesn't pick up the connection between solar activity and temperatures on our planet. Again, when we look at cyclical activity, Arctic sea ice volume. Now you were told that the Arctic sea ice volume is all-time record lows. Let's take a look at just the 2004 to 2013. That's the gray line. And then every other year subsequent to that, the black line is 2018. We have definitely eclipsed several other years, so I don't know in the media why they keep saying that it's all-time record ice loss when, and again, the Danish Meteorological Institute published in these ice concentration studies. I will take you to David Dilley's work here. He and I had a great interview. It's in my playlist. He talks about warm water pulses into the Arctic. They're on a nine-year pulse, and these in turn culminate into a 72-year cycle. And moving forward from this point, there will be less and less warmer water pulsing into the Arctic, which means the sea ice shall increase. 
not only the extent, but what we've also seen this year is the thickness has increased greatly. They're up in the six meter band range, which is 18 feet thick. Again, we're taking a look at different anomalies, zonal winds. Now you have to realize where these zonal winds are, carbon dioxide turns into a solid again and falls back out as a, not a snowflake, but a carbon dioxide flake. So when they say that CO2 is even affecting these types of 10 millibar zonal winds, there's a different mechanism at play here. The sun. Jumping over to Hudson Bay ice coverage should be melting already, but it's still at a hundred percent coverage as well as the passages leading into and coastal. So while I was in the Canadian Ice Service digging around, this gives you some thicknesses of the ice. And also taking a look at the coastal areas between Greenland and Canada, Baffin Island area. Multi-year ice made up much more concentration than they'd thought and also the thick and the medium ice was more than they anticipated as well. This new and young ice, which the media tells you, look at that, that's the orange. How much is the total composition of young ice is there? So another thing that's happening is there's so much ice that's up there now, it's clogging into what's called an ice arch. Now as this ice arch backs up, it creates massive flows behind it, larger icebergs, and you'll see that this season as well, there'll be a huge amount of icebergs coming. What's interesting though, Baffin Island is the same exact area. Now Baffin Island has been pinpointed to the first glaciation known point for the last major glaciation on our planet. And then it makes you wonder when we look at these ice arches, zoom in here, these are all at 79 degrees north latitude, is this a precursor when the ice blocks up there? Does it have some mechanism to cause cooling and more snowing up in that area that then has the feedback loop of blocking high pressure systems that creates more snow? Taking a look at the iceberg season, this is just a few days ago. Above average, the average should be 34 this year and there's over 100 shown here with the Canadian Ice Service. Now we don't have the April global temperatures in yet, but we do have the March 2018 University of Alabama Huntsville satellite. And as of March 2018, we are only at one quarter of a degree above baseline and descending. And you'll watch it pan out over these next couple of years. It's going to go below the baseline and then you're going to have to ask yourself what excuse will they use when it actually goes below the satellite era running average. Jumping down to Antarctica, we don't want to leave out the Southern Hemisphere, they're our friends too. Antarctica, friendly penguins, more ice to play on this year. You can see 2017, and the lighter blue is 2018. That is just a hair away from the 1981 to 2010 average. Let's talk about snow cover for the Northern Hemisphere. On the right is March of 2017, just a year ago. What we have on the left is March 2018. You can take a look at the difference in where the snow has fallen and what the concentrations are. And if you think there's more snow this March than there was last March. Now keep in mind, this is a monthly composition compared to a seasonal total. So they're quite different, but one will lead to the other, I believe. Look at fall northern hemisphere snow extent. That is an upward trend. And I'm really curious when we get into 2018 fall, it seems that the snowfall is increasing in the spring and the autumn compared to the middle of the winter. When you look at all the charts, the middle of the winter this year didn't have as much snow as what it seems on the border periphery seasons, harvest and planting. So how much snow does this really mean for us in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, it's about 700 million tons more. That is so far over the averages that it makes you wonder, why is this not in the media? We should be extremely happy that the temperatures should be dropping and there's more precipitation cooling our planet. 
Again, I'll come right back to the spring northern hemisphere snow extent. It was in a decreasing trend, but then suddenly 2017 bucked the pattern and for sure 2018, the blizzards that have been rolling across the United States, the anomalous snows in Central Asia, Asia, and then those late season snowstorms all across Europe and in northern Africa are definitely going to be adding to this. So 18 should be, again, an anomaly. So two years in a row of an anomaly, how many years in a row do you need to make it a trend? And talking about the fall as well, this is really important about how much time our crops have to mature in the fields because this year planting is so delayed. The fields are still covered in snow and where it's not snow, it's flooded and the ground is cold and soggy and they're just not able to plant. And everybody says, well, if you get your crops in the ground by May 15th, it'll be okay. Not really if the snow and the cold and the out-of-season blizzards are going to start rolling back in early September. That is not going to be a full grow season, so we come right back to the fall northern hemisphere snow extent. And you see these last couple of years, 2015, 2017, near the all-time highs. That's the top two out of the top three all-time highs. Now, what's going to happen this year, not sure, but I'm going to say on my own volition here, it's my own prediction that it's going to be snowier. So let's jump over and see if we can find other cycles that might affect the climate of Europe because these massive floods that have been coming through, and if you've even been watching the news slightly, just Europe is in a mega flood at the moment. Everywhere, massive hailstorms, massive flooding. And then we look at a chart like this when you the planetary alignments. Where are these massive floods coming in that are actually pegged to once in a 300 year flood that have come through 1356, 1742, and these years. So do we find any fall Eurasian snow extent? This would be Europe and Asia, Eurasia. Last year seemed to be down a little bit, but we found the same thing. You know, it's right near the all-time highs. That would be the number two back in 2016. When we're talking about the solar activity decreasing, here is the forecast going out for the next 30 years. This solar cycle 24 has not even finished yet, and we are going to come into even a lower solar cycle that will be less than 25 sunspot average. This is going to take us into the grand solar minimum and all the effects that we see magnetically, electromagnetically with our magnetosphere weakening, jet streams going out of flow, air temperature differences that we have not seen in literally multi-centuries, if not millennia, are strengthening across our planet. And then this was a chart I made earlier overlapping the collapse of Chinese dynasties with the temperature declines. And now suddenly we see China right back in the headlines again when they are having damage to their crops, specifically fruit because of super freeze in northern part of China. And their crops are being delayed as well, planting. Too cold. And also in the central regions, Yangtze River Valley, flooding. So all we have to do is really look back in time. Just take a look at a history book. Go back several centuries, look into the Maunder Minimum, or go further back into the 1300s like you saw on the chart flooding for France there, the spore or minimum. Go back to the late antique little ice age, 535 AD. You'll start to see these same temperature patterns re-emerging again. And I do want to point to the one down in northwest Africa. That all-time record snow in Algeria and the all-time record snow in Morocco, that never could have been thought of in the wildest dreams of global warming. But here we are again matching a pattern that occurred 400 years ago. And right across North America and Canada, United States, that darker blue, that's exactly where we've seen these blizzards rolling through. You look at Alaska, they're always talking in the news about to take it warmer than average, warmer than average. Well, yeah, during the last Maunder minimum, the other prior grand solar minimums, it was warmer than average. So I'd like to take a look here also at the North Pole view. So that crosshair is right at 90 degrees north. That's on the North Pole right there. And I'll just ask yourself to take a look at this and see where you see temperatures that are matching up with our prior cycles.
If it's any indication, that area in dark blue are our major crop growing zones from Europe to Asia to North America. Food is the number one necessity for human beings. I don't care if you have free energy and your gasoline, your oil, your heating, your electricity cost you zero cents. If you don't have food, that's meaningless. Society revolves around food production. And moving forward, and moving forward, we can forecast how intense our weather changes are going to be as well. This is the true state of the climate. The intensity is going to amplify from here. The chart you're seeing is Shepard, Zarkov, and Zarkova with a double dynamo in the sun. This is about different layers in the sun with magnetic canceling waves. When all four of these waves cancel, we get into something that looks like this. When they're completely apart from each other, that is a canceling wave. I've added in the red dots and the lines so you can see the approximate amplification in terms of how many times more than the last year. So what we've seen in the last of 2017 moving into 2018 was really intense and now we've moved into 2018 and you see that split has gotten wider. So what you've seen so far in the first, let's say, quarter of 2018 has to get four times more intense as we progress into 2019. It's going to split and it'll be six times more intense. And whatever happens during that time in terms of losses, you can see that's going to amplify and then carry over into 2020. So 2020 will be a great gauge for us as a society globally to see how much food we're producing at that time because that is going to carry again to the exact same production into 2021. So if we lose, let's say, half of the wheat production, the following year will also be a loss of half the wheat production. These are the things we should be talking about in the media. Understanding some of these longer cycles that it's not all CO2, it's the sun driving our climate and we have massive changes coming to us and we have massive solutions to figure out going in. This is a time to thrive and prosper. This is one of the best times to be alive. There's the most opportunity ever in human history right at this moment due to what you're seeing on the screen right here. If you can see this as an opportunity for you to thrive, prosper, help others, and build yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, you're in the right place. This is the true state of our climate moving forward, and I thank you so much for watching. I encourage you to visit our sponsor, Hemp Lucid, who made this production possible. Also linked in the description box below, CBD oil. Do the research yourself on the net to see the benefits for your body.